From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Portland is preparing for one of the biggest transformations in its history. Portland City Council is in the process of making a transition from the government you know today, a commission style, to an entirely different one approved by voters last year. The city's chief administrative officer, Michael Jordan, is leading a transition team to help with the shift to an expanded city council elected by geographic district and a mayor city manager style of bureau management elected through ranked choice voting. This week, Jordan's plan for a new work structure for city government became public and council will vote on it October 19th. Until then, the public is welcome to comment. Meantime, City Commissioner Dan Ryan marks his third year in office this week. He joins us with his thoughts on the plan and how that transition's going and what strides City Council's making to improve the Rose City. There are also reports Ryan hasn't ruled out the possibility of running for mayor himself in 2024 to help lead this new form of government. His fellow commissioner, Mingus Maps, has already thrown his hat into the ring. Will Ryan join him? Here to answer those questions and more, welcome to my guest, Portland City Commissioner Dan Ryan. Welcome back to Stray Talk. Always great to have you Thank here. You, Laurel. It's always good to be here. It's great to have a conversation with you. Well, as I mentioned, your colleague Mingus Maps was here on this show last week talking about <clears throat> his candidacy for mayor. So tell us here straight up on Straight Talk, are you going to run for mayor? Straight Talk, right out of the gate. <laughs> right. I am 100% committed to being a public servant that's completely focused on the work right now. I think it's so important that as a city battles with, I would say, multiple urgencies that are, have us in a state of emergency, we need to act like it. So for me, it's about staying focused on the work. Since we don't have a primary in this new form of government, I don't see the reason for campaign season to start this early. So I will make my decision right away in January of 2024. So I think our Pat Doris would call that a hedge, but it, so it sounds like though you haven't ruled out the possibility. I have not ruled it out. I just think it's really important today to stay focused on the work. And I don't wanna jump into the campaign season when people can get a little distracted. So I wanna make sure that right now that we're all focused on the emergencies that are facing our city and I will make that decision. And hopefully we'll have a shorter campaign season since we don't have a primary anymore. If you don't run, is there somebody you would like to see be mayor? I have not made that decision for sure. I gotta first figure out what I'm doing when it comes to my service to my hometown. So it means you haven't decided on whether you'll run for city commissioner either because you have to run again um, from your district. Which district are you in this new I'm geographic the, district? I'm in the geographic district that's north and northeast. It's two, I think, which is easy to remember because I'm position two right now. But yeah, so I just, I mean, I've been on the ballot all the time, right? So first I ran for the special election after Nick Fish passed away, then I ran again uh, last year. And now it looks like I would have to run again if I choose to continue in my service role. But you haven't decided on that. I haven't decided, yeah. Okay. Well, let me talk to you about a new form of government because the city is really busy about trying to make this transition to this new style of government that voters approved. And the chief administrative officer, Michael Jordan, revealed to the public this week a draft plan, sort of how the city would work. And, and I have a copy of it here. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about how it will work and what your concerns are. What are your thoughts about it? Well, first of all, that's some fresh ink right here. So this is just just right new. off the press. Yes, right. it is. Um, I think, first of all, that the Michael Jordan and the team, the bureau directors, the chiefs of staff from all of our offices have been working their tails off on this. So I applaud all the effort. It is very important that we hit the ground running on January 1, 2025. My biggest um, edit that I've expressed to a few people, and especially to my council colleagues and the mayor, is that we have um, in the five work areas, there's um, three that I think could become two. So there's a finance one that's separate from operations and then a third one, which is public works, which I think should stand because that's our programming. But I do think that we're missing out on uh, parks and arts in the children's levy. I think that those external children and family focused um, activities should be in their own work area. It's very important that the city really focuses on families. Um, it's gonna be really important for the city to stay strong and rebound and be a, a significant relevant city in the future. Once you lose your family population, it's really hard to, to bring a city back. And so I think it's really important that we have more attention on that. 
So you can offer amendments when the city council votes, I understand. Will you offer an amendment on that? I will work with my colleagues to see what that amendment looks like, but yes, I'm, I'm gonna be talking about that. I also think we're confused on where we place the Office of Equity and how that fits into the system. Um, it's, a, it's still a fairly new professional unit, if you will, in most organizations, and we have to figure out how to operationalize it, and I'm not sure if we landed it right yet. So I am sensitive to where we put the Office of Equity. So the public can take a look at this and see what you think of it on the city's website, uh, just released this week, and then um, can comment on it. You can let, let yes, them know please. what we, you Yes, please. We'd love to hear from the it. public. Yeah, we're building this together. Yeah. So you were opposed, though, to this new charter reform measure that voters voted on last year, but you said that if approved, you would support it, and voters, 60% of voters did approve of it. But just this earlier this summer, you joined forces with your fellow commissioner, Renee Gonzalez, to float an idea of an alternative measure to put before voters that would tweak a few things. It would make the commission just eight members instead of 12. It would give the mayor veto power, and it would also change to a more commonly used form of ranked choice voting. You did didn't get the support of the council, so you tabled the idea, but why did you want to make those changes? Well, Commissioner Gonzalez brought it to my attention. I thought it was worthy of a conversation. We've all been hearing from our constituents about some of the details that they passed. I don't think I could find anyone that didn't want us to move from the archaic commissioner form of government. And I, I met a lot of people that wanted a stronger mayor. They wanted a, uh, an executive branch and a legis legislative branch. And that's really the one that I'm still attached to. I think that it's odd that we're putting together a, a form of government with an executive branch and a legislative branch without the tools that most democracies have in all of those situations, which is a veto for the, the head administrator, which would be executive, which would be the mayor, and then an override for the, the rest of the council. That's the one that I do think Portlanders will want to vote on eventually. How do you think this new system's going to work? Do you think voters That's are going to like it? That's just checks and balances is yeah. what I'm trying to say. What's do you that? think they're going to like this new system? I think that voters are really want to, constituents want more, uh, they want their representatives to be closer to them, and I get that. Uh, so I think that the geographic distribution is smart. I think it'll be fascinating to see how three of them will work together as a team with their constituents, and you have to start the collaboration somewhere, so why not in each, in each district? As I mentioned, this is your third year in office, and I know there are a couple of signature initiatives you're particularly proud of, and one of them is permitting. And I know at home a lot of people are going to go, permitting sounds kind of dry, but it's really important to how the city works and functions. Tell us about some of the changes that you helped lead the way on. Yeah, when I uh, had the Bureau of Development Services and we received the audit back in 2020 that said that it's not working well, which I think anyone that's dealt with the permitting system in the city of Portland would have agreed with. But what I also asked them is, why is this just focused on the Bureau of Development Services when there's seven bureaus that are actively doing permitting, and then there's a planning bureau that constantly comes up with new codes. I call it code clutter, because we don't tend to clean them up. So I asked for all of them to come together in a collective manner, and I asked uh, Commissioner uh, Maps to join me as the co-chair, and then worked extensively with every office so we could keep building this and moving it forward. We established uh, data sets, we did customer service surveys, and most importantly, we got results. So 35% of the permitting timelines were decreased during that period of time. The fact is, in past efforts, we brought this to the council um, over the last 20 years. They didn't do this groundwork. They didn't um, cultivate the soil, as I like to say. So we we're throwing uh, seeds like on this table and expecting them to grow. So the work that I was able to collaborate with the rest of the council on gave us um, the agency so then we could actually vote on the unification. Unification begins and ends with all of us on city council. We can't let egos get in the way of this when the people on the ground are working together. I want to see that momentum continue. So now the process is streamlined through one Bureau? We, yes, that will be established coming up here next year, and um, I'm very supportive of that, and I really am proud of the groundwork we did to make that vote actually realistic. Something else people will know you for is the Safe Rest Villages, and even though you're no longer in charge of housing, you've still uh, overseen what's happening with those villages. There are now seven of them. Um, give us a progress report. Yeah, and it's actually the through line of how I'm proud of myself as a public servant. I tend to look at policy as how to implement it. I don't want to keep adding more policy that won't be implemented. So this was a tough one. Um, as you recall, it was um, a new idea to actually have something for chronically homeless people on the ground that are dealing with um, more than one or two conditions, and how can we 
help them receive services and then move them into housing with more stability, hooked into services. And what we're seeing is some great early results. One, we have over 500 people that are safely sleeping tonight. When you combine the seven safe rest villages, one more than promised, coupled with the, the, uh, the, the sites that the mayor and I co-sponsored, which, which um, will probably be under the same umbrella eventually. And we're really proud of that. That was something that was really needed when you look at the continuum. It was kind of like not having um, pre-K in for kindergarten when it comes to the school system. I felt like that's what was missing in the homeless services continuum is that on-ramp from chronic homelessness to some sort of stability so that when they are housed, they actually have more resilience built in. So this is meant so to be a transition. It's a transition. And we're looking right now, the average stays are somewhere between six months to nine months. So that's where the early results are showing that over 50% are landing in permanent housing. Let me talk about the, the latest one, the Safe Rest Park in the Sunderland Safe Rest Park Village in Northeast Portland mm -hmm. for people who were homeless who were living in RVs and campers. There are 55 spots there mm -hmm. run by the Salvation Army. At last check, there are about 25 that were being used. Our Blair Best talked to a number of folks who were living in RVs who were frustrated about the process of how to get into that village. They say that information isn't readily available on, on how to be allowed to get in. So let's listen to a gentleman that Blair talked to named James Black and hear what he had to say. No one will talk about how to get in. It's like a closely guarded secret. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. You have to just happen to be come, up, come upon by one of the um, community outreach workers that they use to refer people to this park. There's no way to get in touch with them. I've tried calling, I've tried emailing. It's just, it's been really frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. So what do you wanna to say to, to Mr. Black? Should it be so hard for people to get information? I no, of course not. I think I think it's really important that we, we know that Salvation Army and PBOT as partners are working together on this. I also want to say thank you, Salvation Army, for stepping up. This is the first of its kind in Portland. It's complicated. Unlike the the tiny homes that we have in the Safe Rest Villages, the, the rest of them, someone's going from basically not having a lot of amenities on the ground to really wanting to move into that uh, into that tiny home. Here we have people that are um, attracted to what they're living in. Some of them, that is their home. And so it's very, it's more of a nuanced uh, entry. They, the expectations were they'd put five in per week. They're about four behind that in terms of their goals. So it's not as bad as it sounds. We knew that it had to be incremental. And when I went out there two weeks ago, what I learned is that there's a lot of complications with safety. They have to make sure that when they move these in that they get them all um, regulated so that they're safe, literally, and that they're um, good for the, the air that they're breathing. So we do like a safety check to make sure that that home that they have. Well, how do you help people like James Black who said they're just not getting information? They, he went up to the gate at the Salvation Army uh, there at the village and they handed him a phone number for Peabot. And, um, Peabot's the main outreach mm -hmm. uh, in, on this because Peabot is monitoring who's out there and they are, the Peabot people are telling us finally there's a place to take people. And so this will get built and hopefully someone like James is in communication as we speak with Peabot and they're working on their unit to be ready to move into the village. I, I can't get that micro. I just know that I'm really thrilled mm -hmm. that finally Peabot it has a place to take people in this situation. Your fellow commissioner, Mingus Maps, has said that he wants the city to sever its contract with the county with the Joint Office of Homeless Services because of a lack of accountability, that the city really doesn't have any say of, over how that money is spent. What do you think? Do you think the city should end its contract with the county and the Joint Office of Homeless Services? Yeah, I was part of the 3-2 vote that said we should extend it one more year, and I did it because I had an amendment that was all about accountability. I think it's everything that Commissioner Matz was speaking to. What the voters and what, what we all need to understand is where are we, where we're going. So it was making certain that when we meet with them in a couple of months and a check-in on this, is that we have data that shows um, exactly who's living on the ground, who's living on our streets, and what is the what 
what type of services are they that are they achieving and that's what we've been missing is that that date that scan like we had to do even with permitting everything that I build I always bring in data to it because we have to be a data driven culture and uh, in, in addition to that accountability with the providers so if you're getting a contract from government and you're a provider in the nonprofit space what are you measuring to make sure that you're looking at success through measurements and that we're in communication with you about that so I put a transparent transparency and data-driven solution into the amendment. And I was really thrilled that the new director, Dan Field, was all on board with that. I was very supportive of him. I didn't want our new leader of the joint office who comes from Kaiser Permanente, who understands data-driven solutions in his first few months on the job to be told that we're breaking up with them. So even with, with the audit that showed a lot of problems with the joint office, you have faith that Dan Field can turn things around? Audits are rear-view mirrors. So you, you, you look at the information and you, and you learn from it. And then you move forward. I know that Dan Field is, is doing everything he can to improve the culture. I know that the city and the county have to figure out how to work together, not just here, but obviously on community safety. And of course, I, longer conversation, I wish the two were merged, honestly, because we have so many fumbles, but this is an opportunity for us as a city and a county to accept that we're in a shared responsibility for the number one crisis facing our city. You're also in charge of the Parks Bureau, and, and sadly, you had a, a devastating, tragic incident happen at one of the park's pools. At the Montevilla pool, a young girl drowned earlier this summer. She was 12 years old. Her family had fled Afghanistan a couple of years ago. I, I know that must have been heartbreaking for you and your team, but there were lifeguards on duty. How, how could something like this happen? First of all, I'm very sad. We have been since we got the news. I found out over the weekend, and then we found out late on Monday afternoon after that weekend that she passed. And my heart goes out to the family and the community. My job as the commissioner overseeing parks is to make sure that we really learn everything we can from this tragic incident and make sure it never happens again. And um, the family, of course, is, is shattered, as is the whole community, and particularly the immigrant community. Um, and we want to show you a link to a fundraiser to help the family. Uh, it's a GoFundMe, and at last check, it had raised more than $25,000 if you would like to contribute to that. I want to ask you about the Grant Bowl. There's been a lot of controversy over the Grant Bowl, the field there that the Grant High School soccer team and football team plays on. And right before practice was supposed to start, they found out that, that the field had been deemed unsafe. The, the Parks Bureau owns that as opposed to PPS. And a lot of students and parents are really, as you know, really upset about that. They felt like Parks didn't maintain the field and then didn't act with urgency to respond to the problem. What do you want to say to them? I want to say that it's important that our students at both Grant and when Benson returns to their high school have access to the athletic fields next to their high schools. Those are the only two high schools in the area that share their athletic fields with parks, if you will. And so we have to continue to improve that agreement with one another. This one was really tough because the the both people at the city and at, at the, at the uh, school district were working together to mitigate this situation and they thought they had it solved. I found out when it was official that it wasn't going to work. It's kind of like you have a lot of leaks in your roof and you're hoping you can patch it, but instead you have to change and improve the entire roof, which is going to take longer and be more expensive. That's what we're dealing with at Grant Bowl. And I hope that um, we will get to a place where it'll be back and running and we're in conversations, negotiations with the city, uh, the city and the, and the I almost said schools, county, right? city and the school districts to make certain that together we come up so that we put children and athletes first in that area and also we'll have some conversations about a swap because there's community people that use Grant Bowl that aren't a part of Grant High right. School and they like that access as well so like everything in parks when you're dealing with where people play it can get messy and we have to get to the bottom of it I like the uh, conversations we're having with PPS I think we're all in and we're putting the community and particularly the Grant uh, and Benson community first but the field still won't be they're going to be bused to the old Marshall High School campus or Delta Park. The field still won't be fixed until next year, right? Yeah, contractors that know a lot more about this explain to me many times how it's impossible to take care of this um, during the rainy season that's upcoming. And our goal is to make sure that we don't have this problem happening in the next year. Commissioner Dan Ryan, time for us to take a break, but there has been a big breakup in the arts community. The city announced it's letting its contract with the Regional Arts and Culture Council expire. Why? We'll talk about that. And as the unofficial commissioner of the Portland Trailblazers, we get his take on the coming season. We're back in two minutes.
Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Welcome once again to my guest, Portland City Commissioner Dan Ryan. Once again, it's great to have you with us, Commissioner. Yeah, I'm enjoying this. Well, I'm glad because you're also <laughs> the city's art liaison, and yeah. there are some big changes coming up with the city and the arts and funding. It's causing a pretty big stir in the arts community. For nearly 30 years, Portland has funded the Independent Regional Arts and Culture Council, or RAC, or RACC. RAC, in turn, provided arts education and advocacy and managed grant funding to local artists. The city funding was about $6 million a year, but you're ending the contract at the end of this fiscal year. Why? We're ending the sole source contract. This started with an audit in 2018 that Commissioner Nick Fish asked for, and it revealed, and that's when we revealed that we should have more oversight, that um, that's when the uh, city's arts office began. And so with that oversight, more questions have come up. And in fact, what's been most challenging with this was last year, in the end of the calendar year, they came to council in December, and prior to that, all the commissioners met with the RAC leaders, and all of us were having challenges just getting basic financial information. Then when they came to council, that frustration continued, and in fact, the report wasn't even accepted. It's very rare the report is not accepted at city council. Then when I got the assignment, I looked in a little bit deeper, and I thought, you know what, we need to get, we need to really level with this. And so I think the best way to do it is to stop a sole source contract with just one organization and instead put it out to market, break it down into at least four different areas. RAC is welcomed and wanted uh, in terms of applying to be a contractor in some of these areas, but it's really important that we shake it up a bit because my goal is to have more of the public money that goes towards the arts, to, the percentage to increase that actually lands with artists and lands with arts organizations and less in bureaucracy. Let's talk about RAC's response. Debbie Garman, the interim board chair of RAC, told OPB's Dave Miller that they were surprised by your decision and in her words, she believes the texture and richness of the Portland Metro's arts community will be diminished. She said, honestly, because of the expertise and heart and vision that the RAC team is engaged in and relationships created with artists that allowed artists to survive won't be there without RAC. Is, is this going to hurt the arts? No. Uh, first of all, the arts uh, ecosystem is much bigger than one organization. And we have been over 80% of the funding for RAC. And so they're on their own journey to figure that out. I thought it was the right for me to let them know in the first uh, month of the fiscal year so they could have a chance to plan as they go forward. And so I'm thrilled to know that we will, our goal is again to have more money going out to artists and to arts organizations. Let me ask you about the Oregon Symphony because they say their funding has decreased but their costs have increased. How is this going to affect the Oregon Symphony? I think we have to look at all of that because right now, as you know, our city's in many crises and one is that we're having uh, reports that some of our arts organizations, some of our stable arts organizations in the past have decided they can't do their programming this year, such as ART, which is in this neighborhood. And it's really important that we remember that arts is not just about the artists themselves, it's about our economy. Nothing activates the economy especially in a central city more than the arts. And so we need that lens as we move forward. And people, some people are afraid to come downtown, so that's threatening a lot of the arts organization's future. Absolutely, all these, all these things connect. And so when we, when we take a vote on the fact that we shouldn't be uh, smoking fentanyl in public, um, it, it's connected to the fact that yes, we want people to feel safe when they come downtown, not deal with secondhand poisonous smoke so they can get to the arts organizations. In fact, I have a, I have a request, I have a, a challenge. I, and I'll be a part of this challenge. Maybe you'll be part of it too. Um, I want everybody to commit to going to one arts event, arts and culture, very broad category, at least once a month in the central area. And if every Portlander that has the means to do that starts getting out and attending arts and culture events, that would really help revive our downtown and help save our arts ecosystem. I want music to be part of the ecosystem that we built going forward. RAC has really not paid much attention to the music uh, system within, within arts. Well, along with going to arts, I know you're going to go to some sporting events, including the Ducks, but also your big Blazers fan, only about a minute left, uh, but how are you feeling about the team going forward? Well, as arts commissioner, or an arts commissioner, sports, oh, blazer commissioner, you, you gave me you that, are, right? You are, yeah, okay. the trailblazer uh, commissioner. I promise that we will do everything we can to make sure this is a, a franchise in the city for the long term. As a fan, I'm worried. I mean, Paul Allen's been deceased for five years in October, and it's just not working. Uh, we need new ownership uh, at, at going forward. And Jody Allen says this team's not for sale. We'll see. Uh, so my point is, um, 
it, it's important that we get out to support the Blazers, but we also need to hope that we can have new ownership, some new life into the franchise so that we don't get stuck in some of the challenges that we're having right now. I know you were really uh, was disappointed when you heard that Damien wants to be traded. I'm very sad about that. Dan the fan was just speaking, not Dan the commissioner, about <laughs> ownership and about Damien Lillard. But the good news is it's fall sports season and I'm a big uh, college football fan, which is maybe another reason why I want to wait on my decision until January. Okay. So this is the last, sadly, the last year of the Pac-12. And I really hope that all of you know that we could have something special the day after Thanksgiving when the Ducks and Beavers play in Eugene. That should be for all the marbles in, in what is what we know of the Pac-12 today. Well, Commissioner Dan Ryan, thank you for joining us here on Stray Talk. Always a pleasure to have you here. It's really and good I hope you. you'll join me next week when my guest is the new president of Portland State University, Dr. Ann Cudd. We'll talk about the future of higher education. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.